Why don't we take a couple minutes to sit before the evening Dharma reflection? Shelley, does it seem like everybody's there? Great. And before we pick up some meditation strategy, let's just contemplate the possibility of relaxation, softening, Receptive. And when we become aware of a place of tension or holding, then it's not so much about feeling like we have to get rid of that, but more about well, what is relaxation and softening look and feel like when there's tension like this, whether it's mental tension or bodily tension. This is a very active, very enlivening contemplation, like, is it safe to relax, to soften now, and to continue to relax and soften? So an ongoing valuing of relaxation and softening. which is another way of saying that we're willing to be exposed or that we're not going to bother armoring, defending, separating ourselves. But instead, we're going to explore the possibility that it's safe to relax and to allow and to soften that it's safe to be vulnerable to what we're feeling, vulnerable to what's moving in the body and the mind now as experience. It's very important that we don't see this valuing of relaxation as some preliminary step, but it really goes right to the heart of our practice. Is it safe to relax? Including, is it safe to relax with whatever tension, whatever resistance might be present now in the body, in the heart and mind? Exploring the possibility of non-hostility and non-ill will, also known as kindness, tenderness. And of course, quite naturally, we'll notice that we can't do this contemplation on relaxation without depending on this capacity, this natural capacity to be aware, mindfully aware. 
which means to be able to recognize moment by moment to recognize that it's like this. Because relaxation is always in the context of how it is. We're relaxing with how it is. So there needs to be awareness of how it is in order to act on this value of relaxation So instead of thinking that we're meditating, we're just sitting here valuing relaxation and noticing how this capacity the heart has to be aware of the present moment really supports this exploration about relaxation, allowing, trusting, letting things be. And very closely related to this capacity of awareness that we recognize is this sort of the more energetic or assertive aspect of awareness, sati, mindful awareness, which is this active interest in the present moment or active interest in the way it is, active interest in connecting with the way it is, not trying to figure out the way it is, So this interest has some wisdom. It understands it's not about me interpreting the way it is. Interest really is all about connecting with, sensing, connecting with what's real. Here, now, changing, of course. Because this is what we're relaxing with, or exploring that possibility at least. So it's the interest that really supports the continuity in our practice, this unwavering, brightening curiosity. Like wisdom understands that it has the thread of something that is of utmost importance, freedom or release. So it's not going to forget. So we're valuing relaxation, relying on this capacity to be awake to remember to recognize the present moment because we're relaxing with that and sustaining interest, not forgetting. Keeping this way of relating to the present moment in mind, whether the heart is able to relax with conditions as they are or whether the heart, the mind, or the habit falls into the pattern of resistance or disconnection in some way. But then we just are curious about relaxing with that and aware of that resistance and interested, sustaining that interest
This is really the transforming power of wisdom and awareness. We'll continue in silence for another five minutes or so. See what can be learned about relaxation, awareness, and sustaining awareness. And remember, we're curious about relaxing with the way it is. We're not imagining that I have to get or create some experience that then I can relax with. What does relaxation feel like, look like when it's like this, when my mind is like this or my body is like this? As nice as it is to relax, that calm, settled quality is quite healing and pleasant. But 
these three trainings, this interest in relaxation, this recognition of the knowing mind, that the mind is knowing this, knowing the present moment, and that interest that allows that present moment awareness to be sustained. When these three are have come together and balanced, then the mind is going to have insight. It's going to see what it hasn't been able to see because of superficiality and distractedness. It will transform one's understanding. Feel free to move a little bit if you need to. Nice to be with you all tonight. All of you on Zoom, all of you at the retreat center. So as maybe you might imagine, it seemed appropriate to have for me to take some time tonight to offer some reflections on our practice, our mindful awareness practice. What do we mean by that? What's the big deal about mindfulness? You know, it, I'm sure, you know, I don't know what percent, but a pretty significant percent of our friends and colleagues, um, if we told them, you know, that we were really into being present or really into mindful awareness, you know, they might kind of acknowledge it, but they might think it's sort of one of those indulgent things. You know how it is, there are so many different therapies available these days to, you know, evidently will lead to our well-being. And it's just very easy to put Mindfulness in that same category is just another one of those marketing things or one of those things that people market because they can. So it's really important, like, because, you know, we have this unusual situation where we have some time on our hand to devote to the practice we have to become independent in sensing the value in the practice. Because if we don't, if that doesn't become our own, like we've collected our own facts, we've observed well enough, not perfectly, we've observed cause and effect when there is some continuity of present moment awareness, what that sets in motion for me directly, immediately in my life when I don't have that continuity of present moment awareness, what am I at risk for? What tends to unfold from that? You know, we observe enough that it gets sort of written into our bones. Oh, this is the way. It's not easy, but this is the most important thing. And what's really dangerous for us is when we don't have a sense of what the most important thing is, you know, because then we're really susceptible to somebody else telling us what the most important thing is, because it's, it's so unnerving not to know what the most important thing is. So then we're, 
subject to the political winds or the marketing winds that come our way and think, well, maybe having a nice electric car is the most important thing or, you know, being a Democrat or being a Republican is the most important thing or whatever it might be. Saido Uteshaniya, somebody that Shelley and I have studied with, quite important teacher of ours and uh, Burmese monk. And uh, he said at the end of one of his retreats that I was at, um, I would like the retreatants to get to the point where they realize that without focusing or paying attention, the nature of knowing is happening. They're too busy thinking, <clears throat> they're practicing. They need to step back in order to see what's happening. They need to switch from doing to recognizing. And at another time, he just said, it's what really breaks his heart. I mean, this is my paraphrase of what he said, but what really moves him, what really inspires him to teach and to put in a lot of effort to create practice opportunities is that when people have enough experience, they then make the effort to the, develop the practice. They, they understand, like I've been saying independently, oh yeah, this is the way, this is what needs to happen. This is the missing ingredient. This is at the top of my priority list. And that when people don't have that, it's easy to be dismissive or not put in the kind of effort. And the effort that we're making is very specific, you know. Mostly we make the wrong kind of effort. We're sort of trying to do the practice muscularly, like as if getting tight represents good effort. But really in this practice for this retreat, the effort we're making is to be interested, not disinterested. And being interested in the present moment requires a kind of humility and freshness. I mean, it's already the present moment. So we don't need any muscular effort to get to some experience that we can be mindful of, that we can be aware of. So it's, it's just a matter of being interested that, oh yeah, this moment, this activity of body and mind is being known, felt, sensed, right? This is the life. This moment is all I have. And then the next moment, but it's just one moment at a time. But, you know, just for all kinds of reasons, we have all of us to some degree, have gotten very much caught, even addicted to our thoughts about things, our interpretation of the present moment or the interpretation of me or my life. And it doesn't work. <laughs> it's just the cause for stress. Because as the Buddha said so provocatively, however, one conceives it, it will always be otherwise. So no matter how much you have studied the Buddhist teachings on that intellectual level or other deep philosophical, metaphysical understandings of the way it is, and you can have sublime or refined thoughts, interpretations about what it means to have a mind and what it means to be experiencing experience, I mean, I've read all kinds of books that are as books about the subject of the mind and experience, you know, really profound. But you don't always get the sense, even you don't often get the sense that the author is experiencing reality that way. It's kind of like mathematics. They're talking about life, but from this abstract place where they're sort of projecting the idea of me with a life or me with a mind, me experiencing experience out here. And we can create really beautiful maps. So what we're waking up to is something that's embodied 
and real, not interpretive, not other than what's here and now. And so many of our conditioned habits, instincts is to reject that. I mean, isn't that right? Like even right now, this moment, I mean, it's like, I may not know much, but I know this isn't it. <laughs> you know, we're just so certain about that. Like whatever awakening is, whatever deep unconditioned love might be, great clarity might be, well, it's not here. I got to get to it out there somewhere, right? Which is all, that's already just ideas. I mean, there's only this. So as soon as we have this idea of like later or out there, then we're in the conceptual realm. The mind is identified or caught by the conceptual. It's like we, um, we construct constructions with our thinking mind about the practice, about me, about how I'm doing, about everything. And then we get seduced or spellbound by our own constructions. And then eventually, you know, betrayed because no matter how we conceive things, it's not the way it is. I guess we could say reality is not a conception. <laughs> reality is here and now. It's the way it is, here and now. Like the Buddha said, finally, after contemplating his awakening for several weeks, staying in that area by the Bodhi tree, um, finally had this utterance of, you know, wide open are the gates to the deathless. For those who can listen, you know, bring forth your confidence. That it's like, even though he kind of hesitated, at least as the story goes, you know, hesitated to teach because it's, the teachings are refined and subtle. Um, it was this sense that it's here and now, like it's, it is available. And there a little later in that, in those discourses, you know, those with little dust can see this, little dust in their eyes can see this. When we're fortunate enough not to be overwhelmed by life, the conditions, circumstances of our lives, we may be those people with little dust in our eyes. We'll sign up for a Buddhist retreat or take up the practice in some way. Ajahn Sumedho says, we are not looking for something somewhere, but opening to the way it is here and now. And then Sayadaw Tejaniya, the awareness we are seeking is unprompted. We are not digging for it. We are simply residing in the ebb and flow of nature itself. We don't need a different moment of nature because what we're interested in, interested in are the uh, underlying truths or principles or qualities of nature that are always sort of there in any moment of nature or this or the way it is. That's why we don't need a special moment. Now, Obviously, if, if you trigger me and, and really upset me and my mind gets identified with the pain or the upset, you know, I'm not going to be able to practice well because of that identification. But in theory, wisdom can see the underlying nature of the way it is in any moment. It's just when the moment is very seductive, then the mind's not gonna think to relax and recognize the present moment and sustain that present moment awareness, right? Because it's plotting revenge or feeling violated or, you know, and obsessing about that or closing down because I feel threatened. So we need, we do need special circumstances 
to be able to come up with this balance of relaxation and this sort of recognize this remembering to recognize awareness we're recognizing that mirror like quality in all of our minds like right now you can without you or me having to do anything there is this aspect of the mind let's call it that can be aware that it's like this so in a sense aware of what consciousness is knowing so i sometimes call it a reflective awareness So there could be self-consciousness, but there can be an awareness through self-consciousness. There can be some irritation around some pain in the body. Like my feet have been so hot lately. I don't know what's going on and wiry and twitchy. So there can be the awareness. I mean, there's I'm sensitive to all of that. And then there's the emotional reaction like irritation or why me? Or what am I doing wrong? Or why do I have to take all these medications that do all this weird stuff to my body? You know, so, but there can be in any moment, as long as the mind remembers to recognize it, then the mind can recognize that all of that is being known. All of that is being experienced, being felt being sensed. And we forget to remember that this is being known, right? We haven't valued it enough. And then sustaining that is really, uh, what I mentioned is that sense of interest. It's really, this is the assertive part. I mean, so much about wisdom and awareness is receptive and soft and yielding. But the one thing that is assertive in the practice is like this sort of wholesome desire, like wanting to know, wanting to understand, wanting to see the truth of things, wanting to really connect, not wanting to be disconnected, not trusting disconnection. Right. So that interest comes from that deep, you could say it comes from a deep, well of compassion like understanding sometimes you hear me hear me say and it comes from the uh, buddhist early buddhist teachings you know what's onward leading and uh, the buddha says you know the path has just one taste the taste of freedom and this taste in a sense is unforgettable unmistakable and that's that's how we know what's onward leading and so once we have enough our own experience, so it's not borrowed from our teacher, then that, then that interest really arises from that. It's the, not that we're not forgetful, we don't get swept away into our habits of fantasizing about this or problem solving or obsessing in the ways that we've been habitually obsessing. All that stuff happens, of course. We don't waste time judging ourselves when we notice it. Instead, we, f we try to find that interest in the present moment, this moment. We don't waste time about all those moments that have gone. <laughs> They're gone. But this moment is here. And the capacity, you know, to be awake, to recognize, to remember to recognize, and to sustain that, and to relax and trust that, and to bring these qualities into a balance that leads to insight. There's another little teaching passage from Saito Tejaniya. Let the mind and body do what they do naturally. It just needs to be seen, that's all. When you don't have clarity, never mind. Just keep practicing, just acknowledging there is not much clarity. That's right view. 
wise view, right? So when we're confused, when we think we're practicing badly, when we're reactive, then what do we do? We just remember to recognize this is being known. It's like this now, it feels like this now. We just keep practicing. There's a kind of um, confidence we build in this backward step. You know, Joko Beck, uh, I found a really wise teacher who's dead now, but she was the head of the San Diego Zen Center for a long time. Has some great books, a couple great books out there. Charlotte Beck, um, but her spiritual name was Joko. Um, but she had this little acronym, ABC, a bigger container. <laughs> and it's like, whenever we're caught, whenever the mind is doing what we think it shouldn't be doing, instead of the normal reaction, you know, which might be shame in one moment or trying to sweep it under the rug or destroy it or get seduced by it, you know, whatever. This teaching, this whether you want to call it a backward step, where we're always real, realizing this aspect of wisdom and awareness, which is however caught and entangled the mind was in one moment, there is no, nothing in the way uh, for the next moment to be a recognition, oh, it's like this. So there's always a way, it's not, you know, using kind of a three-dimensional map is not really right, but there's always a way to step out of it. It's always, and however caught we are, the wisdom can always, in just a moment, in the next moment, oh, it's like this. This is an experience being felt, being known. And that has that element of relaxation, that element of remembering, that mirror-like quality of mind. And the mind that knows that entangled state is not the entangled state. The mind that knows is released. So when I, like I have pain and I'm not liking it and my mind is identified with the not liking, you know, and so I'm subtly moving my body so people watching my little rectangle on the screen don't think Mark is moving, right, because I have pride or something like that, right? It's like all this, this is the nature of entanglement. It's like one thing on top of another. And then, oh, wait, that's not good practice. And then judging that, and then one, and then, you know, more and more and more. But in any moment, Wisdom and awareness can simply recognize this as being known. This whole entangling mess is being felt. It's like this. It's just a moment, a moment of mind that feels and looks like this. Can this be okay? Like, is it safe to relax? Is it safe to allow? Can we let nature be nature, the nature of the mind in this moment? It's already here, but it makes sense to hate it or reject it. How does that take care of me or take care of anyone? So remember that because um, it's a, that ABC or the backward step, because just that sense, like, just the remembering of ABC, you've already, the mind is already, like if you're really entangled with anger, you won't remember it, right? It's like it will be, how dare you try to come into my consciousness, you know, this Dharma teaching, because this is serious, right? When we're, it's like a friend, you know, if I somehow stood over your shoulder when you were meditating and your mind got really entangled in some self-centered drama and I was psychic and I just kind of came over, you know, and ABC, so, you know, that would be so cool. 
but within your own mind, you know, just like to, to conceive that there's a bigger container is already the bigger container is the point I'm making. Does that make sense? Just to know the mind has this capacity to recognize, oh, it's just something being known. As intense and entangled as it is, it's just that intense and entangled experience being felt and known. And any doubt that arises in the next moment is just that being known. And even like you want to kill the Dharma coach who's telling you all these things, well, that's just being known. And that is the real heart of the practice is just to keep practicing like, whatever the moment delivers, whatever the next conditional arising is in your heart, in your mind, in your body, is to remember to value relaxation. And it's not in a sequential order, like whatever comes first comes first, but remembering to recognize awareness, valuing relaxation, and the interest, a natural organic interest, because you sense the threat of freedom, this interest to sustain the relaxation and the remembering to recognize the present moment. That you sense the power, the transforming power of wisdom and awareness, the continuity, especially of wisdom and awareness. You know, if suffering arises, as the Buddha says, from not understanding suffering, if tension arises from not understanding tension, if heaviness in the heart arises because we don't understand the experience of heaviness of heart, well, then it makes sense that we'd want to relax and recognize that it's like this, that this is being known, and to sustain an interest in that. What's not being seen here? What's not being understood here? Saito Tejaniya makes this point. He says the real objective is to understand things. Happiness will follow naturally, right? We're not trying to be happy Right. This is the the thing about being a practitioner. We sense the threat of of freedom, right? That it's onward leading. But we're not trying to be free so much as having understood that it's it's the not understanding that is the cause for the dukkha. So we're trying to understand. We we have some intuition, you know, over time in our practice that it's ignorance that's the problem, the not understanding or thinking that we know. That's the problem. Because when we think that we know, we're not interested and we're not going to develop that momentum of wisdom and awareness or mindful awareness. It just won't seem relevant. It's kind of humbling like to, to just have that relationship with our conditioned mind, our personality, you know, how we are, <laughs> who we are, how we are. That, you know, that it's it's not a hateful attitude. It's an understanding attitude. Like, oh, I get it. And it just makes so much sense, you know, when we think about where did this personality come from? I always make the joke, you know, well, for me in part, you know, it came from 1960s television, My Three Sons and, you know, those sort of silly programs and their kind of values and biases and worldview that were embedded in all of those cultural inputs that make Mark Mark you know, and then made my parents the way they were and 
and the, they were a powerful conditioning force in the schools and all of that. Well, why would we be surprised to see our conditioned minds being the way that they are? You know, naive, arrogant, self-hate, you know, hating ourselves or ashamed of ourselves or all the different patterns that we all have in varying degrees. Of course. We get so much confidence from, you know, the more we can step back or have a bigger container and really observe ourselves all day long, not just in our sits, in our walking practice, in all the transition times. And we just see the conditioned mind. It's a beast. It's just a natural process. It has causes and conditions. We don't have to even figure out what all those causes and conditions are because what's relevant is every moment it's expressing its nature. It's impersonal, changing, unfolding nature. And to keep seeing this, like a, the wanting monster, the not wanting monster, the you know, just all the wanting to be saved, all these different patterns, but we don't, we just need to keep seeing them. You know, because otherwise we're going to follow all of that, thinking that those conditioned patterns speak the truth. You know, that if I got that, then I'll be happy. Or if I get rid of this, then I'll be happy. You know, when I don't have to wear a mask when I'm in public, then I'll be happy. When I don't have to take all those medications and have all that have all those side effects, I'm going to be so happy. You know, we all, yeah, there'll be some gratification, but you know, there'll be other things. Ajahn Sumedho wrote, the paradox of it all is that freedom to follow one's impulses and desires doesn't seem to really bring freedom. Now, if we haven't learned that lesson, at least in part, let's start learning that lesson. You know, I finally, over many, you know, I've been on retreat as a retreat in probably close to three years of my adult life when you add up all the retreats I've been on. So a lot of time. And uh, being the middle child of seven kids with parents who grew up during the Depression, you know, my parents were born in the late 1920s. So they were young kids during the depress depression and uh, hard times. And just the frugal, frugal, frugal people. And so I always had this thing around food, you know, like scarcity attitude around food. And um, so it was just such an interesting place, you know, because uh, when you're on retreat, you know, there's this big, buffet of food there's always plenty and you can always go back for more and it's the kind of food I like to eat and it was just so uh, to kind of realize that eating more did not make me happy you know but how many times do we have to eat more of course you don't learn the lesson when you're not aware but eventually you start paying attention you know and cause and effect is this for my well-being, the well-being of others, the well-being of both? You know, and, and eventually the mind is even reflecting on that before you get the food on the plate, while you're putting the food on the plate, while you're eating, and after you're eating. And eventually it just, you get, the mind gets clearer. Some, some of us, it takes 40 years, you know, other people, it takes two years. But about, like, how to take care of this life. Are we going to let our heart our life rather be run by habits that arose out of causes and conditions? Or are we going to let our life be led and guided by observing cause and effect? 
what is for our own well-being, the well-being of others, and the well-being of both, as the Buddha says. So again, this quote from Ajahn Sumedho, the paradox of it all is that freedom to follow one's impulses and desires doesn't seem to really bring freedom. This is how I see it from my own experience in life. I found that while I thought I was free to follow my desires, I ended up feeling very confused and enslaved by desire. You know, I often think about my choices in life and just to work hard and spend a lot of time kind of with common ground stuff over the years. And I kind of uh, don't really have any social life outside of common ground and don't really have too many hobbies. You know, I read a little bit and watch some things, but you know, I haven't really picked up any hobbies. And I used to do a lot of athletics and exercise stuff, enjoyed that, but that sort of has fallen to the side over the years. And uh, and part of it was this, uh, like, not trusting those desires. I mean, there's pleasure there. And I'm not saying it's balanced. I think it's a little off balance. But I understand the whole, like, at least I thought when I was engaged in Dharma stuff, I was setting good in motion. And it kept me out of trouble. And I think that was a big part of it. You know, when Wynn and I started Common Ground back in 1993, at least... From my mind, I'm not so sure about when, but from my mind, it was like, I knew the nature of my mind well enough to know that if I'm not in the middle of something like a Dharma organization, it will be trouble, you know, just to sort of give myself because I don't trust following my conditioned desires to achieve, to be seen, to be special, to have stuff or, you know, just all the different ways that I'm conditioned. I feel those forces in me. And when we develop awareness, you know, then we don't need to sort of <laughs> overwork or whatever people do, you know, because awareness, wisdom and awareness itself, it really, um, it's a provocative intervention in our habits, to our habits. Uh, somebody who died recently, a Dharma teacher, he used to teach at IMS back in the 90s, Corrado Penza, he's Italian, passed away maybe a year ago. He wrote uh, or spoke, mindfulness is an obstacle to our well-greased patterns of attachment and ignorance. Or Jack Kornfield said, mindfulness disturbs the tranquility of our ignorance. I really like that. Because <laughs> it's true. There is a certain ease to just following our habits. I mean, obviously they set us up for trouble, no doubt about it, but sometimes that trouble is down the road or the excitement masks the trouble, you know, the, of following our desires, the intensity, the danger even, you know. And when we cultivate intentionally cultivate the stability of present moment awareness, continuity of present moment awareness, this capacity to relax and allow so that there can be this present moment awareness. It really, uh, it's a challenge. There are sparks because the force of habit, part of the force of habit, what condition habits depend on is not seeing them. They're literally threatened. You know, we sometimes we personify these things, but I don't think that's necessarily wrong. These patterns are very intelligent. They're intelligent in the sense of wanting to continue on. <laughs> and so, you know, we we don't want to think of like when in Buddhism, you know, Mara or in other traditions, the devil, you know, evil forces. But ignorance has real intelligence. It has built-in feedback mechanisms. And present moment awareness, wisdom and awareness is a threat to that momentum. 
So that's why the practice is hard. That's why we do our best to create supportive conditions where there's enough safety or at least as much as we can. Safety and enough comfort and enough support from the teachings and the teachers and our fellow retreatants. That's why we take a vast view. Like I'm not going to give up, but I'm not going to sort of demand that I'm fully enlightened by the end of this set, right? Because we're sort of participating in the natural process of awakening. And the primary way we participate in the natural process of awakening is we do this very provocative thing. We learn how to keep the present moment in mind. And it's really supported by relaxation and it's supported by the interest that sustains interest in the present moment, interest in understanding the way it is that sustains this present moment awareness. This kind of interest uh, got expressed very well with this little teaching from Saito Tejaniya, where he said, your experience is only the knowing and the known. Shelley was making this point this morning in the guided instructions. You know, there's just this experience being known. Your experience is only the knowing and the known, whether with reference to the object or the awareness, what is it like when it's personalized? And how is the experience different when it's not personalized? Find out. And this is the added piece that Saida brings into the instructions. You know, we value relaxation. We remember to recognize awareness of the present moment. It's like this now, this is being known. We cultivate that interest that sustains that, that deep interest in the way it is, that because it has the flavor of liberation. And then that fourth instruction that Saida will bring in, and he sometimes says it's the only instruction around wise view or check your attitude around wise view. And this teaching is really to that point Right? There's only knowing and the known. So whether with reference to the object that's being known or the knowing of the object, what's it like when you personalize it? And what's it like when you don't personalize the object or the knowing of the object? So when self-view is involved, how is it? How does it work for you? What sets em what is set emotion? And when there's an absence of self-centeredness, what is that set emotion? And that's what he means by checking the attitude. This is just a, you know, a short overview of how we practice. You know, this style of practice where Shelley and I are telling you to bring your attention to a particular object, which you can do. You can return to the breath. You can return to the lifting and placing of the foot when you're walking. You can return to the chewing and the tasting when you're eating or the movements in your room when you're putting your clothes on or taking your clothes off, preparing the bed. Right, So there, there are these anchors that we can use and should use, but they're all in support of valuing relaxation, remembering to recognize that this is being known and being interested, having that sense of the transforming, liberating power so that we're willing to sustain present moment awareness. And so it can build some real power. That's the momentum that we can experience on retreat. And, you know, it's so unusual for humans to have this kind of time to devote to the practice and these kind of supports. And we, know, we don't really know if we'll ever get them again. I mean, hopefully we will, but we don't know, do we? So let's use this time in that relaxed, gentle, but steadfast way. Just, okay, value relaxation. Recognize this is being known. Sense the freedom so that the mind is interested in sustaining 
at forgetting. So thanks for listening, everyone. We have about 30 minutes now for walking, movement practice. Come back at 8.30 tonight. We'll probably just have a slightly shorter sit, maybe 30 minutes, maybe even a little bit less. Shelly will be leading that sit. We'll do some chanting at the beginning of that sit as well. So we'll see you in a little bit.